Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, glad to uh, see y'all here. Um, but for real, I hope you all are having a good time, um, you know, probably being able to have this break away from class and just have a little bit extra time for yourself. Uh, I know I'm having a really good time. Um, got caught up on a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm really, really enjoying this time. But uh, I wanted to get us a little bit back on track and talking uh, about some more practical stuff, you know, when it comes to communication. And I feel that these next three chapters are pretty good when it comes to, uh, you know, managing our own relationships. And so we're going to talk a little bit about inter interpersonal communication and um, some theories on what this type of communication insinuates. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about conflict management. And then next week, when we get back into class, we're going to talk about something called PUGS, uh, which is some conflict resolution stuff, which is a little bit of a continuation from this. Uh, so today, we're going to be talking about five things. Uh, what is interpersonal communication in the first place? Uh, what motivates us to even develop these relationships? What it means to have self-disclosure? Uh, then we're going to go over the stages of relational development and uh, conflict in relationships, okay? So typically, when we think of interpersonal uh, communication, we think of communication that occurs simultaneously. Uh, let me let me move it. That occurs simultaneously with another person to mutually influence each other, and usually for the purposes of managing relationships. So I know it says mutually influencing each other, but that doesn't mean persuasion or trying to change somebody's mind. Uh, whenever you ask somebody's birthday, that affect, that question affects the both of you. Uh, that person has the piece of information that you want, and you are asking to receive that piece of information. And so it doesn't always have to be persuasive, but it could just be uh, thought-provoking influence. So when we think of relationships, what are some relationships that you have in your life? Um, you might typically think your family. It could be between you and I. Um, your friends, your high school friends, college friends, they all have different levels of immediacy. And uh, if you know what immediacy means already, we'll go a little bit deeper on that. Uh, but that's a really important part in interpersonal relationships. So what are the different types of relationships in the first place? <coughs> so there's primarily two that we see. There's relationships of circumstance and there's relationships of choice. So when we see relationships of circumstance, they usually develop because um, life, life brings you together. And we typically don't have a choice in this. Um, typically, it's because of a situation you're both in. So when we think about uh, relationships of circumstances, we might think family members, coworkers, uh, maybe classmates or your assigned roommates. So in, for example, your for your uh, dorm roommate, that's a relationship of circumstance. Uh, the relationship that you and I have is the relationship of circumstance. Relationships of choice are a little bit different, uh, but I'm pretty sure you can get where I'm getting at. These are the relationships that we choose to engage in. So the friends that we hang outside, hang out outside of work and school and the places that we go to, that's relationships of choice romantic partners as well. Um, typically, we, uh, we're we stuck with a lot of people without much choice. I'm pretty sure you can see that there's a lot more relationships of circumstance in your life than there are relationships of choice. Uh, but it's just a fact of life. So do you think that relationships of circumstance can turn into relationships of choice? I want you to think about that. All right, if you answered yes, you are correct. I've had plenty of relationships of circumstance that turns into relationship of choice. Um, you know, you are hanging out with your coworkers, not hanging out, but you're working together and you're getting to know each other. And after a certain time, you you see, you think that you want to actually, you want to actually be real friends. And so you choose to hang out with each other and you choose to uh, manage that relationship even further. So now we have 
the different types of reasons, you know, why, why do we even develop relationships in the first place? So we'll see there's different reasons. We see interpersonal attraction. And so interpersonal attraction is basically the degree in which you desire to form that relationship with someone. It's not always romantic. It could be platonic. So, so if y'all don't know the reason, there's there's a difference in, in relationships. There's platonic relationships and then there's romantic relationships. So the romantic is, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, husband. Platonic is more like, um, you know, non-romantic. So family members, uh, uh, friends, family, or friends, classroom, uh, classmates, teachers. Okay. There's uh, what we also are attracted to people because of similarity. You know, we want to get into relationships because people are similar to us. So if they are into video games, art, movies, books, if they believe the same things as you, uh, maybe if you are at the, a similar organization together about uh, wildlife protection, you might uh, make a friend there because you're both you're, you're both interested in in protecting wildlife. Then we have relationships of proximity. So you have probably have this one as well, this relationship. But uh, let's say you're sitting in class uh, when we get back. What, think about communication class, all right? Whenever you're in there, who are your friends? Think about the people that you typically um, sit around, all right? The people that you sit around, you're going to be a lot closer to them the relationship-wise than you would with somebody that's sitting halfway across the class from you, right? You're not, you're, you're just not in close enough proximity to be able to talk to each other that is um, respectful to the classroom. So you're talking more towards the people around you than the people further away from you. So we think of like long distance relationships. Why, why don't they work out sometimes? Well, it's because of the proximity. Proximity is very important to relationships. Then there's physical and sexual attraction. So these are two different types of attraction. Physical and sexual attraction are different. Remember that. You can be physically attracted to somebody without being sexually attracted to them. So when you're physically attracted some, to somebody, you might think, um, you know, like, oh, I, I love I love your outfit, dude. Like, you, you are looking awesome today. Whereas, like, sexual attraction would be like, damn, ma, you look fine as hell, you know? Like, you can tell that they're, like, you can like the look of somebody without being sexually aroused. Um, but usually you would, it's a slippery slope. Like, can, can you be sexually attracted to somebody and not be physically attracted to them? Usually not. Usually they come hand in hand, you know? Then, uh, there's also this, some, there's this thing called the matching hypothesis. And so the matching hypothesis basically states that when we're looking for relationships to start, we usually hang out with people that are owner our own attractiveness level. So that's why you might think your friends are, are good looking because they are just um, as attractive as you are, if not more. But you typically, uh, this hypothesis typically states that you are going to be in relationships with people that are to the same attractiveness level as you. Then finally, complementarity so we get into relationships because they complement this other person complements us so you don't want you you probably wouldn't want a person that is exactly like you but you would want somebody that compliments you so when you think of complementarity what kind of characteristics are you thinking of think about it So some examples that you might go through automatically are, um, you know, a disorganized person versus an organized person, a messy person versus a clean person. They might, you know, be similar in some ways, but these traits, you know, they complement one another. And so um, usually it'll be the person who has those habits getting the other person who doesn't have those habits. And typically those, they, they balance out the habits. So um, if you're inside all day and you start to um, grow a relationship with somebody who likes to go outside, you might find yourself going outside more often and they might find themselves going inside more often because y'all complement each other's characteristic. So we understand what relationships are, 
why we are attracted to certain people. Um, so when we are attracted to certain people, how do we even communicate our attraction? How do we start these relationships in the first place? So like I said, there's something called immediacy. And immediacy is when we communicate our attraction, we typically use uh, our nonverbal immediacy cues, right? So immediacy refers to um, nonverbal cues, such as eye contact, a forward leaning, uh, a forward lean touch, an open body orientation, the communication feelings of liking, pleasure, and closeness. And so when we think about immediacy, we think of th these different things. Uh, we think of preening too. If y'all didn't know what preening means, it, it's like, um, oh, like, you know, uh, you, typically playing with one's own accessories, hair, um, body. I'm not going to say body parts, um, <laughs> but you you would do it to kind of attract attention. You know, like uh, you're you're not really outright saying something, but you're you're moving and flaring. So that way somebody looks at you. So then we initiate relationships. So when we initiate relationships, all right, there's uncertainty. There's things that we don't know about each other. And humans are really uncomfortable with uncertainty. And so we want to know the information. And typically uh, what we'll do is one of three things to reduce uncertainty. This is called uncertainty reduction theory, by the way. Um, it's when we want to feel more comfortable by knowing more things about another person, typically. So there's three different ways. There's the passive, active, and interactive way of reducing uncertainty. So passive, the passive way of reducing uncertainty is when uh, we, you know, stalk somebody's Instagram, we make our observations. We don't really talk to people at this point yet. We're just looking. We're just paying attention to our surroundings and the context clues and the situation um, to learn a little bit more about uh, what goes on and reduce our uncertainty that way. Well, what if that's not enough for us? We got to move on to active re uh, uncertainty reduction. So active uncertainty reduction is not getting the full picture yet, but learning more pieces through other people, right? So let's say you're trying to um, get to know a girl um and uh, or another person let's not make it heteronormative uh, let's say you're trying to get to know another person all right and uh, you, you're interested in them in, in uh romantically and so you know one of their friends all right and so you ask their friend this is active by the way you ask one of their friends uh information about them and you try to get to know more about this other person uh, or it could be about a workplace culture um but you get to know more about that place through a third party okay then finally, we have interactive. And so interactive is when you go directly to the horse's mouth. You directly ask that person um, or initiate that, that conversation with that person. And you, go, you just go for it, right? There, there's no dancing around the, the notion that you want to create a relationship with them. You are actually doing it. And then, of course, you ask questions. Uh, to initiate relationships, you want to you want to reduce that uncertainty as best as you can. You want to avoid avoid self absorption because you don't want to seem like you don't care about anybody else but yourself, right? You want to know you want to show people that you respect other people's identity and that you want to hear more about them. And then finally, complimenting. Pretty sure y'all can get this, but complimenting is uh, a really big part in initiating relationships. Uh, you, it indicates interest, you know, it indicates that you want, you like their, the way they look, you, you are physically attracted to them. So something to think about, you know, is complimenting the same as flirting, right? Do you flirt with your friends or do you, com or when you compliment your friends, is that flirting? <coughs> when your mother calls you handsome, Right. That's not exactly flirting, right? That's a compliment, but it's not flirting. So there's that, like the the context, the context, the entire situation kind of fills us in whether or not something is indeed flirting. So then we get to talking about self disclosure and uh, what it is and how we use it. So self disclosure occurs when we voluntarily provide information to others that they would not. Uh, they would not learn unless we told them. So just personal information about ourselves that we tell people. 
Uh, we we self disclose for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we deepen our relationship. I mean, I'm pretty sure when you tell somebody a deep secret, it it, it increases that immediacy between y'all. Um, you fulfill your need to be accepted and validated because typically in our society, in American society, uh, when someone shares a secret with you and when you do the same, you feel like you are a part of something bigger than yourself, right? You, you're a part of a relationship. You're part of uh, that culture. Uh, some other reasons that we uh, typically self-disclose is to understand ourselves a lot further. Um, and it's usually a freeing experience when, when we tell other people parts about ourselves. You know, we, we talk through what we think and we share our deepest secrets sometimes with others and it's just freeing. So we know what self-disclosure is. Let's talk about what makes, like, what, what are the properties of it? So there's three different things we think about. Reciprocity, risk, and appropriateness. So let's start with reciprocity. Typically, when we self-disclose, when we tell somebody a secret, it's usually because we'd like to get to know them more. So in order to, for them to go, for in order for you to get to know them more, you have to sacrifice a little bit of yourself for that, right? And so that's in hope of getting them to respond to you or to reciprocate that self-disclosure. And so when people reciprocate, it kind of uh, makes sure that there's a balance of power in that relationship. Um, you know, how would you feel if you were the one telling all your secrets and, and or not even secrets, just parts of yourself and the other person would never self-disclose? It would be a feel a little weird, right? Then there's risk. So typically, whenever we self-disclose, there's a level of risk with doing so. So for example, um, if you tell your sibling that you snuck out uh, one night, you run the risk of them telling your, your parents. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, when, when queer identities choose to come out of the closet and uh, self-disclose their true identities, um, they run the risk of harm, you know, either physical, social, or familial. So there, there's a certain level of risk associated with self-disclosing information. And finally, you, there's appropriateness. So have you ever had a random person ever trauma dump on you? So it's not always the most comfortable feeling in the world, especially because your immediacy with this person or your perceived closeness with them is quite low. Uh, you may not want to engage further with them. However, sharing information slowly and over the course of a relationship is appropriate as, a, as you share more personal things and the relationship develops. So we know what, we know what self-disclosure is now, all right? Now, what are the theories associated with, with the self-disclosure and how do we picture that in a, in a more uh, quantit quantitative sense? So there's this one theory called the Altman-Taylor theory of self social penetration. So in social penetration, we have two different uh, aspects. There is breadth and there's depth, all right? <coughs> so when we're trying to think about getting to know people, there are the breadth of topics uh, that we can cover. Um, so you might think of like religion, um, the way they were uh, brought up, the food they like, the music they like, um, different secrets, maybe like familial secrets, personal secrets. Um, yeah, but the, the amount of topics that you can cover, that is called the breadth. Then there's the depth. So you might not, you might know each other's religion, but you don't talk about it a lot. And so that topic might have low depth, whereas y'all know each other, um, Y'all know each other's, um, you know, food likings a lot, like food, uh, the types of food y'all like a lot more than your religion. And so the depth of that topic of food is going to be a lot deeper than that of religion, because that's just not what y'all talk about. Um, so, of course, you know, as your relationships get to, gets more intimate, you get to know each other, the, the breadth and the depth of self-disclosure increases. So the way you think about it is kind of like a wedge. So this way, let's if you see, I'm going to annotate right here. Um, so we might see the wedge like this at first. When you first start a relationship, you don't have a lot of breadth nor depth. But as you get to know somebody, that wedge 
drastically increases and begins to cover more uh, area of of this graph. So we get to know more. We get to know more about people. So each relationship have, has different levels of social penetration. You know, you're not going to get to know me as much as you uh, know your um, roommate. You know, you you spend more time with them and your social penetration might be a lot deeper than it is with me. So another theory that we uh, typically think about is called, um, give me one second. Oh. Let me uh let me fix this right here. There we go. All right. So another theory that we use to think about self-disclosure is called the Jahari window. Um, the Jahari window it provides us with how self-disclosure impacts our relationships. And typically we think of it in, in four different categories. So there's the open category, the blind category, the secret, and the unknown. <clears throat> so when we think about the open category, we'll typically think of things that people know about us and that we know about ourselves. Um, so you might think of like birthdays, religion, typical like surface level stuff. Um, but as the relationship develops, you know, this quadrant grows a lot bigger and bigger and bigger as y'all get to know each other more. Then there's blind. So this quadrant can include quirks about your nonverbal characteristics that you may be blind to, uh, but your close friends may have more of a clue. So an example, which is kind of a little hard to explain, but when someone can tell when you are attracted to somebody and they don't really notice it themselves, but you can tell that like, oh yeah, this, this guy is definitely into her, um, but like you you tell the person like oh man I, I saw you leaning in and you were like making googly eyes and that person's like what I, I was I didn't even recognize that so that would be a blind the blind quadrant then there's the secret quadrant uh this quadrant is where self-disclosure occurs and when you uh self-disclose secrets to others uh you shrink this quadrant on the other hand when you have a lot more secrets than um you know than uh you are open with, then this is going to be a much larger uh, quadrant. Then finally, we get to un the unknown quadrant. And this quadrant is special in that it involves introspection and a lot of self-discovery. Um, those who are a lot more, a, a lot le less introspective have a larger unknown quadrant than those who are good at introspection. Okay, so this is the Jahari window. And so... Those are the different uh, four different quadrants, and uh, you can read a little bit more about it in the book if you didn't really understand my explanation. So we've gone through interpersonal communication, and now we're tiptoeing now into um, maintaining and managing our relationships, right? So one thing I want you all to ask yourselves is, well, why are relationships so important to begin with? Um, you know, relationships are, are constantly changing and, and they revolve how around how partners handle tensions. They revolve around communication. Remember, I, I think around the beginning of the class, I said that relationships and everything that you hold dear, like uh, everything is made from communication. We cannot do anything without communication. And so relationships are that. They, they're, they're how we communicate and how we handle each other. Um, and so relationships are important. Uh, there, there's three different categories of relationships that we typically think of. Um, we think of like friendships uh, slash like, you know, romantic relationships. Um, they're important to us throughout our generation. Uh, typically as young, young people, we don't have that close of relationships. But as, a, as an adult, we, we begin to develop those, those much deeper and more personal relationships. Um, you know, with our family as well. Those are very important relationships. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but typically, um, you know, a baby can't survive unless they have their family or unless they have human touch next to them. And so they have to have that relationship to survive. Um, other than that, you know, humans are social creatures. And with, uh, without other humans to, to talk to, we, we go kind of crazy. Um, 
you know, further on talking about family, think about how the family dynamic has changed over time, over America's history. Um, we typically think of like the nuclear family when we think about American history, you know, a mom and dad and two kids, maybe a brother and a sister. Uh, but that's changed, obviously, you know, as as um, as time as time and culture has gone on, you know, single parents are more are more likely divorced parents. Um, yeah. And finally, of course, colleagues, you know, we, we make friends, uh, not a well, lot of friends, but we, you know, we have coworkers, call, we have coworkers, classmates, uh, people that aren't exactly our friends, but that, you know, help us out in life. Um, so in class, like in class, the person that the people that you sit next to, you're not friends exactly, but you do help each other in class and it helps you get, uh, get through life, your professional career. So relationships are important because they, I, I've personally to me they give me something to um you know keep going for I I love people and helping people and developing relationships with others is very very important to me so this last part we're going to cover what relational uh you know like what what happens in relationships specifically how do they how do they build and how can how do they get destroyed so we think of relational escalation as uh, relation building, right? So there's first pre-interaction awareness. So pre-interaction awareness is basically like making eye contact with somebody or looking at somebody and you're like, whoa, that person, I want to get to know them, you know? Then you acquaintance, uh, you, you become acquaintances with that person. You, you say hi, you, you say hello, you, you try to start the interaction somehow. You, you, it's typically those short little small talk moments. Then as you all get to know each other, you explore, you explore that relationship and you try uh, to become friends. You, you hang out a little more often, uh, you go to each other's houses, um, go out to eat, then there's intensification. So intensification can definitely be, okay, we're official. Like this could be a close friend, but when we're thinking about like romantic relationships, it'd be like Facebook official at this point, you, you officially make it so, you know, that you're, you are officially a couple, right. Or that you, you are officially a close friend of, of each other. It's not as official, but definitely in romantic relationships, it's more official. It's when you get to know people more, uh, you, you're typically, maybe you go to a wedding with them, you go on dates, you go uh, on, on road trips, on, on vacations. And then there's intimacy. So this could be, um, it's typically a little harder to explain this one, but you know, when, when you have a spouse or you just have somebody that you know them and they know you, the totality of you. Uh, when we think about like social penetration, like that wedge is almost, that, that circle is almost completely filled up. Um, you, you have very close intimacy. You have a lot of immediacy too. Um, so this could be, you know, getting married, uh, moving in together, right? Um, get buying a house together. It could also mean, you know, bow chicka wow wow. Yeah. <laughs> so then we see how relationships get built up, but I'm pretty sure, as you may know, relationships can go away and they can crumble. So the first step of this relational de-escalation is known as turmoil um, or stagnation. And so typically you're not really having a lot of trouble but you're arguing right you have a little arguments you have maybe one argument once a week um but it, it and it doesn't always have to be arguments you know it could be just like things are getting a little boring and things are stagnating things are you know plateauing things are not as exciting as they used to be then there's de-intensification so de-intensification is uh, typically you're arguing a lot more or you're not hanging out as much if you were uh, friends. You kind of lose that feeling of closeness, right? Um, in romantic relationships, it's, it's typically arguing almost every day or a lot, like four times a week. Then finally, or then we get to individualization. So individualization basically happens when um, you were like, all right, I am me, you are you, we are no longer we, right? 
that that's when the we goes away. There's no relationship. You're 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 trying to get rid of them now. And finally, separation. You are just you, right? There is they they are out of the picture. And then post separation effects. So this can happen when uh, you know your friends talk about your ex, or you see your ex in the hallway, or your ex best friend. There, somebody you can hear somebody talking about them specifically. Okay, so this is what happens in relational de-escalation. We can see how like the the buildup of arguments can turn into uh, wanting to be your own person. You you will stop hanging out, and then finally you completely stop hanging. Um, and then from there, you only see each other in passing. So when we when we finally get to that point, we see relationship dissolution. And this is, uh, you know, the research term for the end of a relationship. And it, it's um, it's an inescapable part of life. Uh, but something that I really liked about this uh, part specifically is that um, there was uh, some breakup do's or don'ts. Um, so I'm going to read you a couple. So first of all, don't go see other person. Um, you know, it can cause a lot of harm on their end, cause a lot of confusion. I know I've, I have ghosted somebody, not my proudest decision. Um, you, you also need to give the other person a chance to respond. You, you know, you need to remember that it's a conversation and not, not an argument. Um, of course, do it face to face. It's respectful. I recently got dumped by the girl that I was seeing and she did it over the phone. So, uh, I swear, do it face to face. And there's some phrases you should also avoid. Avoid saying, let's still be friends. It's not you, it's me, or uh, it's a timing issue. You know, um, these are lies, obviously, like, be honest, you know, and sometimes it is a timing issue, um, but you should typically be honest about why you don't want to be with that person. Um, you know, it's like filing a customer, a customer complaint. They need to know what, what actually happened rather than just trying to hide from them because nothing can be improved, you know, without honest communication. So do you think you can have a relationship with your ex after you break up? That is going to be the question I leave you with, right? I think no. You might think yes. We'll talk about it, all right? So finally, let's say we're, we're trying to keep the relationship going. We're in that turmoil stagnation stage we are, we're having interpersonal conflict right and interpersonal conflicts is an express struggle between two people who are interdependent perceive incompatible goals scarce resources and a climate of com competition so typically when we think of conflict it involves power there's not always like the uh, like stated power but let's say uh, you have one friend uh one friend with another friend there's not not the explicit power stated, uh, but between those little like social cues, there is power. Uh, we might also think between like a father and a son. Like there's obvious, uh, there's an obvious power dynamic there. Um, and then also it may involve assertive or aggressive communication. You know, it doesn't always have to escalate to screaming matches, but it definitely can. So there's different types of conflict, and I'm not going to go over them all thoroughly. You can cover these yourselves, um, but there are, um, I'll, I'll go over a couple. You know, there's pseudo conflict. Um, this can be fake conflict that lacks from a stem of under, from a, stems from a lack of understanding. So these are people that just don't want to communicate. You know, I, I feel like a lot of these are miscommunication or just the lack of wanting to have that honest, open communication. Um, there's ego conflict, and that could be a personal attack on on you or that other person. Um, irreversible, con irresolvable conflicts, you know, conflicts that you believe cannot be solved. Uh, you might think of like a religious argument. Um, these typically might be irre irresolvable conflicts. Um, but yeah, check check these out for, for yourself. So then finally, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into this uh, when, we, when we talk about conflict management. Um, but there's typically three we'd like to think about. 
There's non-confrontational, which um, basically, you know, backing off, avoiding conflict, giving in a lot. I, I, I would think sometimes I'm non-confrontational. Uh, confrontational, which, you know, it's more of a win-lose approach. And uh, one person kind of want to take, take more control and be more assertive in that, uh, in that conflict than the other. And then finally, there's cooperative style. So this conflict is viewed as, you know, a set of problems that needs to be fixed as a team rather than like uh, a win-lose scenario. So somebody that, you know, wants to cooperate with you and work with you and compromise. So that was the end of chapter seven and eight. Uh, I will be posting a for your convenience along with my announcement that sends out this lecture. Um, so be on the look for that uh, just so it can help you a little bit on your quizzes. Uh, but if you have any questions about chapters seven or eight, uh, let me know. Stop by my office hours. We could definitely talk about it. Um, your quiz will be due on Monday night for everybody. Um, and yeah, I'll also be posting an activity uh, about relational de-escalation and escalation in my uh, announcement. So please be on the lookout for that and uh, just cover it. it. It's in the book, so it's, it's very easy to understand. Uh, but if y'all have any questions, just let me know. Um, other than that, have a good day. I'll see y'all off in space.